directed by Oppenheimer that Einstein never attended. I did not find inspiration for personal work among the theoreticians. One of them showed me a mathematical problem he had come across in his own uh, research. It was neither trivial nor very difficult. After some hours of work, I brought him the solution. He said, but the problem is not His answer discouraged me, and I returned to my mathematical problems, which were there. <laughs> The main memory I keep from this physics seminar and the discussion on quantum vacuum and the intervention of the great physicist. <laughs> uh, but in vacuum, there's nothing. There can only be vacuum. <laughs> there can only. Uh, so there's a typo in the There can only ever be quantum vacuum. Wigner and also Einstein lived in a time when it was possible to think. That the universe at all scales obeys the logic constructed by humanity in the course of centuries. So, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we continue, and our next speaker is Thomas Kerber from Vienna, and he will talk to us on change conjecture for limits of us. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction, and also the ones who have organized for setting up this workshop. It's been really nice so far. And as has been said, I'm going to talk about recent point work with Michael Eichmeier, where we use of a conjecture of the rigidity of the positive math theorem. So the setup is going to be as follows. So we're going to consider a connected complete with Riemannian manifold. And we're going to make And I'm going to assume that the dimension is between G and 7. So this is just to ensure that um, the usual regularity of the surface is applied. And moreover, I'm going to assume that the scalar curvature is integrable. Okay, so as probably most of you know, such a manifold is called asymptotically flat if outside of a compact set it looks very much like Euclidean space. So more precisely, we're going to assume the following so that there is a compact set K and a number tau which lives between n minus 3 and n minus 2. So that the comple uh, complement of this compact set is diffeomorphic to Rn minus a ball. And such that in the so-called asymptotically flat chart, the metric G decays towards the Euclidean metric. So I'm going to suppose that G minus the Euclidean metric delta plus some appropriate decay of derivatives decays like mod x to the minus tau. Okay, so the reason why people care about these spaces in relativity is because they write as initial data for the Einstein field equations for isolated gravitational systems. The picture you should have in mind is of a space time with limited numbers of large masses such as stars and black holes. If you move very far away from these masses, you're going to feel little gravity corresponding to initial data and also the, the space time being asymptotically flat. Okay, so now in this physical context, the scalar curvature doesn't only have a geometric meaning, but also a physical one because it provides a lower bound for the energy density. So this integrability assumption on the scalar curvature here can be interpreted as a finite energy assumption. And now it turns out that there's also a global notion of energy, and this is given by the so-called mass, which is due to Arnovides and Misner. And this mass is defined as follows. So you take a constant, which only depends on the dimension, and then we compute the flux of the metric over a large coordinate sphere. So I take a radius lambda, which tends to infinity, and then I take lambda to the minus one times the integral over a sphere of radius lambda, and I compute xi times dj gij minus di gjj. Okay, so the picture you should have in mind is um, we have this compact set k here. And here, both the geometry and topology of the Riemannian manifold might be very complicated. But once you leave this compact set K, the geometry starts to look more and more Euclidean. And then within this Euclidean part of the manifold, you take a coordinate sphere. And then you 
compute the flux of the metric over this large coordinate sphere over here, which physically you could interpret as, as gravitational flux at infinity. Okay, so one thing to note is with my definition of asymptotical flatness, if you now take a coordinate hyperplane in your asymptotically flat manifold, with the induced metric is also going to be an asymptotically flat manifold. And then if you compute the mass of such a coordinate hyperplane with these decay assumptions, um, you see that the mass is going to be zero. Okay, so let me give you an example, which is the one that probably all of you know. So this is spatial Schwarzschild, which models initial data for a static black hole. So we take a number m, which is strictly positive. So this is going to be the, the mass of the black hole. And then the base space, which I'm going to call mm, is given by all points in Rn, such that mod x is bigger than m over 2 to the 1 over n minus 2. And then the so-called Schwarzschild metric is conformal to the Euclidean metric, and the conformal factor is given by 1 plus m over 2 times mod x to the 2 minus n. I take all of this to the 4 over n minus 2 and multiply it by the Euclidean metric. Okay, so you can easily check that this metric is asymptotically flat of ray tau equals n minus 2. And moreover, you can check that the scalar curvature of the space over here vanishes. And also, if you compute the mass, then um, you end up with this number m over here, so there's no ambiguity. Okay, so it will also be convenient to look at a smaller class of um, asymptotically flat manifolds. And these are manifolds which are asymptotic to Schwarzschild. And by this I mean that the metric doesn't only look like the Euclidean metric at infinity, but actually like the Schwarzschild metric at infinity. So in particular, I'm going to assume that G minus the Schwarzschild metric decays like mod x to the 1 minus n. And in particular, this means that G is asymptotically flat of rate n minus 2. At two yeah. Okay, so one last remark before I can get started. While these Schwarzschild manifolds are not going to be complete if you take M to be negative, of course, the notion of being asymptotic to Schwarzschild also makes sense if M is a negative number because this metric over here is also defined for, for M being negative. Yes? So talk, I mean, usually I see like the torch should be bigger than N minus 2 over 2. Yeah, 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 so this is um, a bit specific. I'll, I'll comment on this later on. Um, so if you are in four dimensions, then N minus 3 is equal to N minus 2 over 2. But in higher dimensions, this assumption is more restrictive than what you generally consider for asymptotically flat manifolds. Now, I, I can tell you later on where this comes in in the proof. So this is basically to ensure that um, a coordinate hyperplane is, again, asymptotically flat. Um, yeah, so a basic challenge in, in mathematical relativity is to understand the relationship of this local energy density given by scalar curvature and global energy given by mass. And the most basic heuristic that you could come up with is that something locally non-negative should add up to something globally non-negative. And this is the content of the positive mass theorem proven by Chen Yao. It is really one of the fundamental results in the field. And the statement is as follows. So if we take a asymptotically flat manifold, with non-negative scalar curvature, then the mass is also non-negative. And you also get rigidity. So if the mass is equal to zero, then it follows that mg is isometric to that Euclidean space. OK, so because it's going to be instructive for what I'm going to say later on, let me quickly give a review of the proof. So the idea is that you suppose for contradiction that we have an asymptotically flat manifold with non-negative scalar curvature, but that the mass is negative. 
Okay, and then the first thing that you can assume is that without loss of generality, you may assume that Mg is asymptotic to Schwarzschild. Because if not, then you can perturb the metric at infinity, and this might increase the mass a little bit, but because the mass is negative, you can still arrange for the mass to, to remain negative. And then the next thing that you can assume is that the scalar curvature is in fact strictly positive and not only non-negative. And again, you can do this by a conformal transformation, um, and this might increase the mass a little bit as well, but again, because the mass is strictly negative, you have some leeway to do this. Okay, so now what Shane and Yao observed is if you take a coordinate hyperplane, um, actually you take two coordinate hyperplanes of height h in your asymptotically flat manifold, and you take this number h over here to be large enough, um, then you see that the mean curvature of this coordinate hyperplane is, is positive. In particular, what this means is that you can use this coordinate hyperplane as a barrier for area minimization. Now the idea is that you take boundary data within this slab. So this is topology, uh, so this is gonna be in Sn minus two. So in three dimensions, this would just be a boundary circle. Now you solve the plateau problem. So this gives you a minimal surface spanned by this boundary circle over here. Okay, now of course you can move this boundary data up and down. So you could also move this all the way up here and solve the plateau problem for this minimal surface. So now what Shane and Yao showed is that these hyperplanes aren't only geometric barriers, but in fact effective geometric barriers in the following sense that um, if you move these boundary data too close to um, this hyperplane over here, then you can show that this minimal surface over here has to have more area than this minimal surface down there. In particular, it follows that somewhere in between you can find a minimal surface which has least area of, of all of these. So it's gonna be this one. Now the idea is that you pass to the limit by making these boundary circles larger and larger. And because all of these minimal surfaces live in this lab, they cannot escape. So in limit, you obtain a non-compact area minimizing minimal surface. So we see that we get a non-compact area minimizing minimal surface. Okay, now because this minimal surface is area minimizing, this in particular means that it passes the second derivative test for area among local perturbations of the surface. So this tells you that if you take a compactly supported function f, that the stability inequality holds. So this means that if you integrate Ricci in direction of the outward normal nu plus the length of the second fundamental form squared times f squared, that this has to be less or equal than the gradient of f squared. Okay, but now the point is because this minimal surface over here is chosen to be the one that has least area among all of these vertical translations. You can actually also put another function in the stability inequality, which is the one corresponding to these vertical translations. And from this, you can show that you can actually also put one into the stability inequality over here. Okay, now of course, the gradient of one is equal to zero, so the right-hand side vanishes. And for the left-hand side, you use the Gauss, uh, the Gauss equation. So this tells you that Ricci nu nu plus the second fundamental form squared is equal to one over two times the scalar curvature plus the second fundamental form squared minus the scalar curvature of sigma. Now, because we've assumed that the scalar curvature is strictly positive, and also, of course, the second fundamental form is non-negative, this is going to be strictly bigger than minus one over two times the scalar curvature of sigma. Okay, so putting all of this together, we see that the scalar curvature of sigma, the total scalar curvature of sigma is strictly positive. Now I claim that this gives you a contradiction because 
if you're in three dimensions, it simply contradicts the gauss bonnet theorem because the gauss bonnet theorem tells you that the total scalar curvature must be non-negative. And now in higher dimensions, um, because this minimal surface over here lives in the slab, you can show that this satisfies really good asymptotic estimates. So in particular, you can show that this minimal surface is close to a coordinate hyperplane in, at infinity. Now, remembering what I said at the start, that the mass of a coordinate hyperplane is equal to zero, you can show that this gives you an asymptotically flat manifold with zero mass and a total amount of positive scalar curvature. Now you can use a conformal transformation to zero scalar curvature and show that this decreases the mass. So you can obtain a asymptotically flat manifold with zero mass, uh, zero scalar curvature, but negative mass. So of course this contradicts the positive mass theorem in one dimension lower. And then by induction, you can go all the way to, to dimension n equals seven. Okay, so the reason why I showed you this proof is because the model of the story seems to be that in asymptotically flat manifolds, positive scalar curvature is somehow incompatible with the existence of area minimizing minimal uh, non-compact area minimizing minimal surfaces. And this led Rick Shane to ask if you can also go down to non-negative scalar curvature in this rigidity statement. So this leads you to the following conjecture. Um, if we're given an asymptotically flat manifold with no negative scalar curvature, and you suppose that there is a non-compact area minimizing minimal surface, then this can only occur if Mg is in fact flat Rn. Okay, and the goal of today's talk is to show you when this conjecture over here is true and when it isn't true. Okay, so if you wanted to go about and prove this conjecture, I think the first thing that everyone would try is just to revisit the proof of the positive mass theorem and see what you can get out of that. And this leads you to the following proposition. So we're gonna assume that Mg is asymptotically flat. And we're gonna assume that sigma is a non-compact stable minimal surface. In particular here, I don't assume that sigma is area minimizing. Also, I make no global assumption on the scalar curvature. And now I make the following three assumptions. So first of all, that the scalar curvature vanishes along sigma. And moreover, I'm going to assume that sigma has good asymptotics. So this is just to be sure that sigma itself is again an asymptotically flat manifold. And then finally, I'm going to assume that is what I'm going to call stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations holds. So this is simply that you can put one into the stability inequality. Okay, so if you have these three assumptions, then first of all, you can show that the scalar curvature must be zero, because otherwise you get a contradiction the same way as before. And the same way, you can also show that the Ricci curvature in the direction of the outward normal must vanish. Likewise, you can show that the second fundamental form must be zero, because otherwise, again, you get that the total amount of scalar curvature must be positive. But then this tells you that you're in the rigidity case of the positive mass theorem. So in particular, it also follows from this that um, sigma must be isometric to flat Rn minus one. Okay, so under this assumption that um, sigma satisfies these two properties over here, this proposition gives you at least one minimal, uh, one minimal surface, which is as flat as it could be. 
Okay, and two things that I wanted to remark is that these assumptions over here, the sigma is good asymptotics and that this stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations hold that you only have to worry about this in higher dimensions because in three dimensions this follows from the logarithmic cutoff trick and also over here you're only using the gauss bonnet theorem and not the positive mass theorem so the asymptotic structure of sigma is not so important for this argument. Okay, so the first result I would like to mention now in the direction of this conjecture is due to Carlotto. And he proved the following. So, so he showed that you can impose additional assumptions such that this conjecture is true. So he showed that this conjecture holds if we don't only assume that Mg is asymptotic to, uh, asymptotically flat, but also asymptotic to Schwarzschild. And if in addition, sigma satisfies the stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations. Okay, so the idea of the proof is basically that you um, work out that sigma is, in using the fact that sigma is stable with respect to asymptotically constant variations, he shows that sigma is good asymptotic, so you can apply this proposition here. But now in Schwarzschild, you can check that if you take a coordinate hyperplane, that the Ricci curvature direction of the outward normal does not vanish. So in particular, this proposition over here gives you a direct contradiction. One thing that you can note, however, in this proof is that you're not using the assumption that sigma is area minimizing. So somehow this doesn't really seem to go to the essence of this conjecture. And it turns out that in general, the situation is a lot more delicate because we have the following result of Carlotto and Chain. that once you go away from Schwarzschild asymptotics, the situation becomes a lot more complicated. So if you're given any number tau, which is strictly less than n minus two, then what they showed is that there exists Riemannian manifold, which is asymptotically flat of ray tau, which has non-negative scalar curvature, strictly positive mass, so in particular it's not flat, but such that Mg contains a Euclidean half space. Okay, so let me make a quick diagram. Okay, so you have this part of the manifold in a shaded region where the geometry is non-trivial. But then you have this Euclidean half space down here where everything's flat. In particular, if you take a coordinate hyperplane down here, um, then it's gonna be a stable minimal surface which is also stable with respect to asymptotically constant variations because all the quantities involved vanish. Um, but in particular, the space over here is not flat. So the, the big question really is, are these minimal surfaces over here area minimizing or not? And now it turns out that in dimension three, they are not area minimizing, because we have the following result. Okay, so in three dimensions, we have that this conjecture is true. And this was proven by Chodos and Eichmeier. Okay, so let me give you a quick outline of the proof of this result. So the idea is that if you have one non-compact area minimizing minimal surface, sigma, 
that you can actually foliate the entire space by such minimal surfaces. And to do this, um, you take two balls, one of them which intersects sigma, the other one which doesn't. Now we take a local perturbation of the metric G with the following property. So this perturbation is going to be supported in this large ball over here, which intersects sigma. And in particular, this perturbation is in a way such that as metric two tenses, it's going to be strictly less than G. So we have that within a support, we decrease the metric G. Now it turns out that you can also arrange this in a way such that outside of this little ball over here, the scalar curvature becomes strictly positive. Now, if you try and look at the problem of increasing scalar curvature, then you quickly see that if you increase scalar curvature somewhere, you have to decrease it somewhere else. In particular, this metric GT is most likely going to have negative scalar curvature in this, in this little ball over here. Okay, now the idea is that you solve the plateau problem taking boundary data on sigma. Um, and now it turns out that you can do this construction in a way such that sigma remains an effective geometric barrier. This gives you a minimal surface which lies on one side of sigma. And now what you can show is that this minimal surface has to pass through this ball over here. And the reason for that is that the original surface sigma passes through this ball and sigma is area minimizing. So the solution with respect to G of the plateau problem would pass through this ball. But now we've decreased the metric in this ball over here, so this gives you an additional advantage. So in particular, any new solution will have to pass through this ball over here as well. Okay, now the idea is, because these minimal surfaces pass through the ball, you can pass through the limit, obtain a non-compact area minimizing minimal surface with respect to GT. And now, however, this new minimal surface could be equal to sigma. But the point is because we can now apply this proposition over here. And this proposition tells us that if the scalar curvature were non negative along sigma, then it would have to vanish. But we see that sigma passes through a region of positive scalar curvature, so it also has to pass through a region of ne uh, negative scalar curvature. So, in fact, this new minimal surface is going to look like this. And because of that, you can let t to zero and you obtain a new area minimizing minimal surface, which is distinct from, from sigma. And as I will show you later on, this foliation by area minimizing minimal surfaces shows you that MG has to be flat. Okay, so what I want to convince you now, though, is that this proof over here is essentially three-dimensional. Because when we applied this proposition to this new minimal surface over here, um, and we didn't have to worry first about the asymptotics of sigma, but more importantly, we didn't have to worry about the stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations. Now, of course, you might say that um, this is only a defect of the proof, but it really turns out that in higher dimensions, the situation is markedly different. Because the first theorem that we have is the following. So even if you take spatial Schwarzschild, the, the situation is very different because we showed that um, there exists infinitely many non-compact area minimizing minimal surfaces in Schwarzschild, if n is bigger than 3. Okay, so in particular, this tells you that this conjecture is not true without further assumption. Sorry, I should write here if n is bigger than 3. Okay, now, if you look at these area minimizing minimal surfaces later on, you're going to see that they're not totally geodesic. So in particular, this proposition over there tells you that they have to violate the stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations. So now, what you might say is that you just have to add this as an additional hypothesis um, in this conjecture over there, but this is not going to save you either, because the second result that we have is that the Euclidean coordinate planes in the color to chain manifolds are actually also area minimizing. <laughs> 
Okay, so this might be maybe a little bit surprising, but actually um, proving this is not so hard. So let me quickly show you what's going on here. So the idea simply for the first result is that you take spatial Schwarzschild. So this is going to be the horizon of spatial Schwarzschild, and then we take a totally geodesic plane passing through the origin. So this is, of course, a barrier for area minimization. And now you take boundary data on this um, totally geodesic plane, and now you solve the plateau problem. And now the result of Chodos and Eichmeier shows you that if you make this boundary circle larger and larger, then the height of this minimal surface over here has to become unbounded. So in particular, as you pass through the limit, this minimal surface disappears to infinity. However, now in higher dimensions, um, a different effect takes place because you can show that if a minimal surface increases its height um, to a certain level, then this is always going to cost a certain amount of area. In particular, you can show that if these minimal surfaces increase their height too much, then they cannot possibly be area minimizing. And to get some, some evidence why this might be the case, you can also look at the fact that catenoids are bounded in higher dimensions, but they're not bounded in, in three dimensions. Okay, so in particular, you can show that these minimal surfaces remain bounded, so you can pass to the limit and obtain an area minimizing minimal surface, which is non-compact. And then to obtain more of these minimal surfaces, um, you can just take boundary data, which you have shifted up a little bit and apply the same argument. Okay, and a similar thing happens in, in these colored to chain examples. Again, the idea is simply that you take boundary data on this, asymptote, uh, on this coordinate hyperplane over here and solve the plateau problem. And you can also show that if you move these very far down, if these minimal surfaces intersected this non-Euclidean part of the manifold, then it could not possibly be area minimizing by direct comparison with this minimal disk over here. So in particular, the minimal surface remains in the Euclidean part, and of course in the Euclidean part we know that the solution of the plateau problem is simply filling in this disk over here. Okay, so the moral of these results somehow seems to be that if you want to prove a positive result on this conjecture, then whatever local information you're going to put into the minimal surface is not going to be enough because in these color to chain examples, we know that half of the space is flat, but still the entire manifold itself is not flat. Um, so in particular, it means that if we want to prove something, then we have to add some, some global hypothesis that gets captured by, by this minimal surface sigma. And one natural way such that, such, such that global information gets passed to a minimal surface is if it arises as the limit of an isoparametric or uh, limit of large isoparametric surfaces. So to see this, um, if I take a plane in Euclidean space, and then I take any point on this plane, then I can take a sequence of balls which passes through this point over here. And of course, all of these balls are isoparametric. So now if I make these balls larger and larger, then the boundary of these balls is, of course, um, going to converge locally towards this Euclidean plane over here. In particular, every area minimizing minimal surface in Euclidean space arises as the limit of large isoparametric surfaces. Now our result is that Euclidean space is actually the, the only space with this property among asymptotically flat manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature. So the theorem is as follows. So we assume that mg is asymptotically flat with no negative scalar curvature. And we assume that sigma is non-compact and area minimizing. And moreover, we assume that sigma arises as the limit of large isoparametric regions. So we assume that um, there exists a sequence of isoparametric regions. That's at the boundary of these isoparametric regions converges to sigma. 
and then it follows that mg must be flat Rn. Okay, so besides resolving this conjecture that I've started and I've stated at the start of this talk, one important application of this theorem is that it gives you a certain control over how isoparametric surfaces in asymptotically flat manifolds behave. So as a corollary, you get the following. So if mg is asymptotically flat with non-negative scalar curvature and positive mass, in particular, this rules out that mg can be flat Euclidean space. And if you have a sequence of isoparametric regions with diverging volume, then if you take any compact set within your manifold, the boundary of these isoparametric surfaces has to be disjoint from this compact set. So if k is compactly contained in M, then it follows that the boundary of omega i intersected with k is empty for all i sufficiently large. Okay, so how can you prove this corollary? Simply if these boundaries intersect the k, then you could pass to the limit, obtain an area minimizing minimal surface, which arises at the limit of isoparametric surfaces. But then it follows that mg must be flat, but this is excluded by the fact that the mass is positive. Okay, so the reason why I care about this corollary is, um, so an important open problem in mathematical relativity is to show that in asymptotically flat manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature and positive mass, um, large isoparametric regions are unique. And this has been shown in, in three dimensions by, by Chodos, Eich, Meyer, Scher, and you, and I think later on also independently by you. But all of their proofs are essentially also three dimensional, so this problem is widely open in higher dimensions. Now, if you wanted to prove this result, of course, you would study a, a sequence of large isoparametric regions. And this corollary gives you some control over how these isoparametric regions behave, because in particular, they have to enter the, the non-Euclidean part of the manifold, where, of course, the, the non-linearity of the problem is, to a certain extent, reduced. OK, so in the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about the proof of, I should probably keep this proposition here, of this result. And the proof is, is by contradiction. So we assume that mg is asymptotically flat with non-negative scalar curvature and positive mass. And that we have an area minimizing minimal surface sigma, which is non-compact and area minimizing and such that it arises as the boundary, uh, as the limit of the boundary of large isoparametric regions. Okay, now the idea of the proof is to argue in four steps. The first step is to show that sigma has good asymptotics. And then the second step, once we've accomplished this, is that sigma actually satisfies this stability with respect to, to asymptotically constant variations. And once we have this, we're in a position to apply this proposition over there, which gives us one flat, flat surface. But as we know, this is not enough to conclude that the entire space is flat. So what we do in the third step is that we create a new such surface. So given any point in the manifold, we show that there exists a minimal surface sigma p, which contains p, and also satisfies um, these asymptotics and also the stability with respect to asymptotically constant variations. Okay, and then the final step is to conclude that the Riemann curvature tensor actually has to vanish. Okay, so let me say a few words about each of these steps. So I don't want to talk too much about the first step because this is pretty technical. Um, but so this works for every stable minimal surface which has bounded area density at infinity. And 
the argument is somehow based on, on a delicate analysis of the, of the monotonicity formula. So if you're interested in this, just let me know and I can explain later on. Um, but in particular, the step over here doesn't use this approximation by minimal surfaces, uh, by isoparametric surfaces. But in fact, the second step does, so I'm going to continue with that one because also I think it's a bit more geometric. And here the idea is as follows. So we take our minimal surface sigma. And as we know, this minimal surface is approximated by um, large isoparametric regions. We get this large isoparametric surface omega i, which is close to sigma. OK, now because omega i is isoparametric, we know in particular that it passes the second derivative test for area among volume preserving variations. Now the idea is that we put a Euclidean translation translating the surface downwards into the stability inequality, and then pass to the limit, and hopefully in the limit we get this ability with respect to translations pointing downwards for the minimal surface sigma. Okay, so there's maybe two bigger issues in this approach. So the first one is that this variation over here is not going to be volume preserving if the space is not flat. In particular, you have to estimate how much this changes the volume and you have to accommodate for this somewhere else. And then the second problem, which is maybe a bit more grave, is um, the part of this minimal surface over here that's close to sigma is actually, uh, sorry, the part of the isoparametric surface that is close to sigma is actually very small. But you also get a contribution from the second variation of volume in, in this entire region up here over here. So what you somehow have to show that in the limit, this contribution in this large part of the isoparametric surface vanishes. And to see this, um, of course, you're using the decay assumption, but there's also an integration by parts formula involved. And to control the error estimates in this integration by parts formula, you then need to use the asymptotics on sigma, and the asymptotics on sigma need to be precise enough to, to compensate for this error term. Okay, so in any case, once you're done with this step, this gives you a one minimal surface, which is um, as flat as can be. Now what we want to do next is to produce a new minimal surface like that. And here the idea is to use a variation of the argument of Todos and Eichmeier. Okay, so again, we're given our minimal surface sigma. And now we take a point P, which is not contained on sigma. Now we would like to show that we can produce a new area minimizing minimal surface, um, which satisfies one and two and passes through this point P. So now the idea is that you construct a perturbation of the metric, which is supported in some region U. Um, again, construct a local perturbation GT. And this is going to be supported in this large region over here. And again, it's constructed in a way such that GT is less than G in the sense of symmetric two tenses. Um, and now again, outside of this little ball here, we do this in a way such that the scalar curvature is increased. OK, but now we argue differently, because the first thing that you can observe is that because you only perturb the metric locally, this means that the mass of GT also must be strictly positive. Now, if you have an asymptotically flat manifold with strictly positive mass as a result of Palotto, Chodos, and Eichmeier that for such a remaining manifold, you can solve the isoparametric problem for sufficiently large volumes. So that's what we do. We solve the isoparametric problem. With respect to the metric GT. And with respect to the enclosed volume being omega i. And of course, if uh, so it's going to be with respect to the metric G. So in particular, if this is large enough, um, you can solve the isoparametric problem. 
And now the point is similar as before. So we know that sigma is approximated by minimal surfaces, uh, by isoparametric surfaces omega i. And we know that the boundary, because sigma passes through that region over here where you've decreased the metric, so that's um, this isoparametric region omega i. And in particular, in terms of area, passing through this region over here again gives you an advantage. Now in this scenario, you have to be a bit more careful because this shaded region over here is also going to change the enclosed volume. But again, you can show that you can compensate for this. And you can show that a new solution of the isoparametric problem, again, for sufficiently large volume has to pass through this shaded region over here. Okay, but then afterwards you can pass to the limit, you obtain a new area minimizing minimal surface, which is approximated by isoparametric regions with respect to the metric GT. And you know that in a limit you obtain a, yeah, as I said, you obtain an area minimizing minimal surface. But then the proposition over here tells you, because this area minimizing minimal surface is approximated by isoparametric surfaces, if it passes through a region of positive scalar curvature, it also has to pass through a region of negative scalar curvature. In particular, this new minimal surface has to go through this ball over here. But now, of course, one problem is that you get no control over what this minimal surface looks like relatively to sigma. So this might not give you foliation anymore. So it could be that this new minimal surface looks somewhat like this and intersects sigma. So you really have no idea what this looks like. Okay, so this is the third step. And then finally, we want to show that the Riemann curvature tensor vanishes. And okay, so we take a point P, now manifold, and we might we may as well assume that the point P is on our or surface sigma, because we've just shown that through every point P in a manifold, we can construct such an area minimizing minimal surface. Now, the idea is that we take tangent vectors, x, y, z, and w. Okay, and the first step is that we can compute that the Riemann curvature tensor of x, y, z, and w vanishes. And this follows from the fact that sigma is totally geodesic and intrinsically flat. So if you apply the Gauss equation, um, it tells you that um, in tangential directions, uh, the Riemann curvature tensor is zero. Okay, now if you do the same thing with the Codassi equation, again using that sigma is um, intrinsically flat, you can see that you can also put in a normal vector here. You see that Riemann of x, y, z, and mu is also equal to zero. Okay, but so far we've only kind of used the extrinsic and intrinsic geometry of sigma, so in order to conclude that Riemann itself vanishes, we probably have to use a more global argument. And now the idea that we're gonna use, I think goes back to, to Anderson and Rodriguez. And the idea is we take our point P, and now we approximate this point P by point PI. So we take. Now for, for each of these points, we pick a non-compact area minimizing minimal surface that is approximated by isoparametric regions. We get minimal surfaces that might look like this. Now there's a few scenarios that can occur, so let me draw another diagram. So the first scenario is the, the good one, where um, sigma and this approaching minimal surface sigma i doesn't intersect. If P is over here, you get a new minimal surface sigma i, which lies completely on one side of sigma. So this is the same situation as in a, in a proof of Todos and Eichmeier. And then the next scenario is that these two minimal surfaces exact exactly once. So the new minimal surface might look like this. But in this case, you can also say a few things because by the maximum principle, if you have two minimal surfaces and they intersect, then they have to intersect transversely. 
But we know that the Riemann curvature tensor vanishes along tangential directions. So if you put this together and add up all the tangential directions, you see that along the intersection, the Riemann curvature tensor has to be zero. In particular, we can assume that this intersection stays away from this point P because otherwise in the limit you could conclude that Riemann vanishes at P as well. Okay, and then you can also say a few things more. So we know that sigma is totally geodesic and we also know that sigma i is totally geodesic. So in particular, the intersection is also totally geodesic. Um, but the non-compact totally geodesic subspaces of um, Rn, Rn minus one are simply again hyperplanes. In particular, we know that this region over here, which lies on the other side of the intersection, that this has to be isometric to a half space. I'm going to call it sigma prime. Okay, and then the third scenario is that the two minimal surfaces intersect at least twice. It kind of looks like this. Um, but again, we know that at the intersection, Riemann curvature tensor vanishes so that these intersections stay away from the point P. And because these intersections over here are again, half uh, are again Euclidean hyperplanes, we know that this region over here has to be isometric to a slab. Uh, again, I'm going to call this sigma prime. In this case, this is going to be a slab. Okay, so. Now the idea is to use that all of these minimal surfaces are totally geodesic. And what you're doing is, because this minimal surface sigma i approaches sigma i, you can locally write it as the graph of a function ui. And then you can linearize this graph function over here. And also, we know that the second fundamental form vanishes along sigma and also along sigma i. So you can simultaneously also linearize the second fundamental form. And then that the Linearization of the second fundamental form is zero tells you the following. So we obtain a function f, which is defined on sigma prime. It's positive because the approximation is on one side. And we also know that f is equal to zero on the boundary of sigma prime. Because on the boundary of sigma prime, these two minimal surfaces intersect. Now we get the linearization of the second fundamental form, which tells us that if we compute the Hessian of f with respect to two tangential vect vectors, x and y, that this plus the Riemann curvature tensor um, of x, mu, mu, and y is times f is equal to zero. OK, so what you do next, I probably should write down a PDE at some point. So you trace this equation over here. Then the first term over here gives you the Laplacian. And this term over here, if you trace it, becomes a Ricci curvature. But the proposition tells us that Ricci curvature in the direction of the outward normal is equal to zero. In particular, f is harmonic. OK, and now I claim that this implies that Riemann has to vanish. So in the first case, we get a positive function, which is defined on Rn minus 1, and is harmonic. So in particular, the Liouville theorem tells you that f has to be constant. But if f is constant, then the Hessian vanishes. So in particular, Riemann also has to vanish. OK, so the next scenario is that we get a positive harmonic function on, on a half space. Um, but that the harmonic function on the half space vanishes on the boundary. And now there's also a Liouville theorem, which tells you that such a function has to be affine. But also for an affine function, we know that the Hessian vanishes. So again, Riemann has to be 0. OK, now the third scenario is somehow a little bit more tricky, because you can really show that there are positive harmonic functions defined on a slab that vanish on the boundary of a slab. But in our situation, we actually get one additional information, because if you look at the Hessian of the, at, at the boundary, then we know that that vanishes at the boundary. So in particular, the Hessian at the boundary is 0. So this means that the gradient of, of this harmonic function f is equal to 0. 
And then what we did is we proved a Liouville type theorem for positive harmonic functions on a slab which vanish on a boundary and have bounded gradient. And what we actually show is that this implies that f is equal to zero. This gives you a contradiction because we've assumed that f is positive. Okay, and you somehow would expect that the third scenario gives you a worse contradiction than the, the other two situations because if you look at the model space and the Euclidean space, of course, um, two minimal surfaces, uh, two planes can intersect once or they do not intersect at all, but you never get this third situation where two minimal planes intersect twice. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.